Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Faisal Khan. Welcome to Houston Medical Clerkship Morning Rounds. Today, we have a very special presentation on an emerging topic called autoimmune psychosis. Uh, Dr. Meher Chahal from uh, Government Medical College, Chandigarh, India, will be presenting this uh, interesting topic to us. She is uh, applying for both uh, psychiatry and neurology residency programs, uh, and we wish her all the best of luck in this uh, residency match uh, uh, year. Good luck, Dr. Chahal. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Like Dr. Khan said, my name is uh, Dr. Meher Chahal, and I will be presenting this really interesting autoimmune psychosis topic which kind of lies between the spectrum of neuro and psych. Uh, so let's get started. Introduction. So autoimmune psychosis, it reflects the presence of diverse immunological and inflammatory processes which are happening in individuals who have been diagnosed in new onset atypical psychosis. Why it is atypical, we will get into it in the future slides. Uh, these subgroups of people constitute that proportion of people who have not responded adequately uh, to the typical antipsychotics when they present to present with you know typical features of psychosis. They do not have adequate response. Etiology. So now etiology is it's complex in the sense that there are a lot of factors which uh, collide with each other and that's what leads to the development of autoimmune psychosis. Firstly you have genetics. Um, there's increased frequency seen in people uh, who have family members who have autoimmune diseases. Another thing that I would like to highlight is that the, the, uh, this will be atypical psychosis because when you take the family history of the patient, he might have family history of autoimmune diseases, but a typical history of schizophrenia or other mood related disorders might be absent, which makes it atypical from other uh, psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, which have a very strong psychiatric family history. Immunologically, there have been multiple loci found on, ML, on the major histocompatibility complex. Um, it, it is mainly present on the B lymphocyte lineages, the CD19 and CD20. Uh, and in, it also, uh, infections have also been a culprit in this, uh, mainly herpes simplex virus 1, cytomegalovirus, certain pro protozoal. But I would say the uh, studies have shown most association with herpes simplex or at least that is the topic which has been most researched. So the combination, all of them interact together and that is how you have the development of autoimmune psychosis. Coming to the autoantibodies associated, the most, uh, most highest, strongest association is with NMDAR receptor antibodies specifically the NR1 subunit, then we have the voltage gated potassium channel complex proteins, then the leucine rich glioma 1, then the GABA receptors both A and both B, A slightly more than B, then we have the AMPAR and the contacted receptor protein 2. So these are the antibodies which have been studied and have been found in samples of people who have been suspectedly diagnosed with autoimmune psychosis. Next, this is a interesting diagram which shows the uh, different factors which are interacting with each other which lead to the development of this. Uh, you know, there will be psychosis of course, the pre uh, you know, patient is presenting with psychosis and then you know when you take the medical history, there will be atypical history uh, family history of autoimmune disorders, you know, he might have a recent infection that he was hospitalized with. Then you have neurological symptoms also predominating, which is distinguishing it from a typical psychiatric presentation. These can be a focal, uh, focal signs, uh, decreased consciousness, headache, and autonomic instability. Then you have after doing when you do the blood workup and the blood biomarkers, you can see the circulating anti or uh, autoantibodies to neurotransmitter receptors, and then of course we have C 
CD14 various antibodies markers which are found in the blood. Now pathogenesis. Now what what we have understood about the pathogenesis till now is that it is basically this autoimmunity is causing upregulation of the inflammatory markers in the brain. The inflammatory markers will be your interleukins, your C-reactive protein, of course it's always increased in acute phase of reaction or in infection or inflammation, then you have interleukin 6, EGF alpha, interleukin 1 and then you have elevated neoterin risk levels. This is a non-specific marker of T helper cell 1, activation dependent immune response. Main inflammatory abnormalities, these are these have been found on uh, brain biopsies done postmortemly. When you take the tissue, uh, we can see under a microscope that there is microglial activation and, pro and the, this is most prominent in brain regions. Of which are functionally relevant to psychoses, dorsolateral prefrontal, superior temporal and the anterior cingulate cortices. So all this is neurobiologically leading to blood CSF barrier hyperpermeability. Next we come to the most important part which is presentation. How will the patient present coming when you suspect autoimmune psychosis? You will have your typical psychosis symptoms, affective changes, delusions, agitations. But another, uh, and in, another important thing to notice, this is going to be a rapid progression, less than three months. It's not going to have a long-standing history of psychosis like schizophrenia requires a diagnosis of more than six months. The red flags which you need to look for, which will point you in the direction of an atypical presentation, is catatonia. We have seen a lot of patients have this symptom when we suspect this. Then an infectious prodrome, like I said, autonomic disturbances, neurological symptoms like cognitive dysfunction, seizures, decreased, con decreased consciousness. Another interesting uh, factor that history taking might reveal is the recent diagnosis of a tumor. Like we have seen that there are paraneoplastic manifestations of tumors. So this, the, this is inflammation of the tumor cells directly going in and permeating the blood-brain barrier and causing inflammation over there leading to an autoimmune psychosis. So when we finally put this patient as a first line on antipsychotics, psych, psych, the patient might not only not respond but it also, he might also develop adverse reactions to the antipsychotics leading to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Next for the diagnosis, I would like to emphasize that nothing can replace a thorough medical and physical examination, neurological and psychiatric. Only then do we come to the investigations because there is no definite investigation which will show us a definite diagnosis of this so we must take a thorough uh, history and perform the adequate neurological examination. The MRI may or may not highlight neuroinflammation. If the MRI is negative, then we kind of proceed to FDG PET, which will show focal areas of hypo or hypermetabolism. Studies have shown and gone more towards hypermetabolism in those areas. EEG will show electiform discharges and extreme <coughs> delta brush wave especially in MDAR receptor antibody which I like I said has the highest association with this. What is the extreme delta brush wave? It is basically a beta wave of high frequency imposed on a lower frequency delta wave. CSF analysis may show pleocytosis of more than 5 WBCs by uh, per microliter and CSF oligoclonal bands. Now we must realize that this is not in every case of suspected. This may show this. CSF biomarkers, you have your interleukins, then you have you know increased protein, albumin when compared to serum levels and CSF and serum neural, neuronal surface autoantibodies. Please know that these are IgG type autoantibodies. Coming to the treatment, now we must realize that 
person coming in with psychosis is going to be aggressive, he's going to be agitated, he's going to try to fight the staff. So we need to establish a secure neuropsychiatric unit with adequately trained staff and personnel which can handle the patient and you know make him calm and we get him secured like that. The acute phase obviously we need to calm down the patient with antipsychotics. Now because like I said that there have been adverse reactions to antipsychotics so we must follow the approach of go slow and then titrate up. ECT has been shown to be effective in some refractory cases and now coming to an interesting part which is immunotherapy and steroids. Immunotherapy um, agents like rituximab have been studied and some people have shown adequate and good responses to it but then we need a high index of clinical suspicion that this is actually autoimmune psychosis and not your typical schizophrenia type psychosis and now we can you know initiate immunotherapy for this. Differential diagnosis. Now this can be a confusing topic for many since it's a newly introduced kind of disease and concept. So we must learn to differentiate it from these diseases. First we have encephalitis which is you know obviously more inf uh, infectious, inflammation, acute. Then we have schizophrenia like I said requires the six month diagnosis and more your, your typical family history of psychiatric problems. Then you have multiple sclerosis which is causing neuroinflammation. You have vaccine waning of these symptoms, you know, your typical people living uh, away from the equator, getting it, the ecological factors of that. Then you have Hashimoto's and Graves, these are, you know, your thyroid autoimmune antibodies. Then you have SLE which can pre present with neuropsychiatric symptoms and psychoses. Celiac disease and neurosarcoidosis. Um, then coming to the last slide, which is thank you for watching.